Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Atlanta Rotary. So great to see all of you. Happy holidays. Sharon Gay will be leading our invocation and Pledge of Allegiance today, followed by Betsy Higgins playing the national anthem for us to sing together. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I happened to run into Chef Hill Hale late last week and you know, checked with him briefly about what his topic, you know, to confirm what his topic was about. And as fellow Episcopalians, we immediately knew which parts of the Book of Common Prayer were relevant. So, <laughs> so for the other Episcopalians in the room, you may recognize some of this. Let us pray. Lord God Almighty, in whose name the founders of this country won liberty from themselves and for us, and lit the torch of freedom for nations then unborn, grant that we and all the people of this land may have grace to maintain these liberties in righteousness and peace. You have made all the peoples of the earth for your glory, to serve you in freedom, justice, and peace. Give to the people of our state and nation a zeal for justice and the strength of forbearance, that we may use our liberty in accordance with your gracious will. Grant us grace fearlessly to contend against evil and to make no peace with oppression, and that we may reverently use our freedom, help us to employ it in the maintenance of justice in our community and nation, to the glory of your holy name, now and forever. We pray that in the words of Dr. King's last Sunday morning sermon, with faith, we will be able to hew out of the mountain of despair the stone of hope. With this faith, we will be able to transform the jangling discords of our nation into a beautiful symphony of brotherhood. God grant that we will be participants in this newness, in this magnificent development. If we will but do it, we will bring about a new day of justice and brotherhood and peace. And that day, the morning stars will sing together and the sons and daughters of God will shout for joy. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you both. Enjoy your lunch. Hello. Welcome again to all of you. Welcome to Rotary. I hope you all had a great weekend. I know our thoughts and prayers go out to all those in Kentucky following the loss and devastation over these past days. We are pleased today to host our annual meeting of the Atlanta Rotary Club. Dave Moody, our nominating committee chair, will lead us in voting in our new officers for next year, followed by a terrific program on democracy with our featured speaker, Sheffield Hale, CEO of the Atlanta History Center. Terrific, terrific program ahead today. 
A warm welcome to all of our guests. I'd like to introduce each of them now. If you could please stand and remain standing when I call your name. I will start with a fellow Rotarian visiting Robert Hall, who is a guest of Blake McBurney. Robert is the past Rotary, a past Rotary International Director, and as you may remember, was the chairman of the 2017 Rotary International Convention in Atlanta. Welcome back, Robert. Also, a special welcome to Michelle Gerpsoff, who is Consul General of Belgium in Atlanta. Welcome to you, guest of Jim Munson. And then our additional guest uh, of fellow Rotarians, we have Richard Makerson, guest of PJ Bain, Robin Cole, guest of David Cole, John Duke, guest of David Duke, Fatima Umba, guest of Jim Munson, uh, Joanne Huntley, guest of Walt Huntley, Natalie Allen, guest of Jeff Rosenzweig, Audrea Reese, guest of Mar Margie Stagmeyer, Lovette Russell, guest of Michael Russell, David Zacks, guest of Ken Stewart, Tammy Joyner, guest of Maria Saporta, Ed Cunliffe, guest of Bill Nordmark, and Claire Haley, guest of Sheffield Hale. Welcome to all of you. Congratulations to Rotarian Anna Roach on her recent uh, news as her new role has, is beginning as Executive Director of the Atlanta Regional Commission. We look forward to welcoming Anna more officially in just a few moments. Anna is a new member of our club. Um, in other Rotary news, the TurkNet Leadership Group, TLG, has been named to the 2022 Bulldog 100 list. This is a special recognition by the University of Georgia that celebrates the top 100 fastest growing businesses that are owned by Georgia alumni. Congratulations to Rotarian Bob Turknet and his wife Lynn who co-founded the company 33 years ago. As we all know, COVID remains very much in the news and will be that way for the foreseeable future. We have a COVID task force that is chaired by our fearless Sergeant at Arms, Kevin Greiner. And I want to assure all of you that we continue to monitor the COVID situation very closely and will update the club on any changes. Um, as always, I would ask that you continue to wear your masks when you're not otherwise eating or drinking. We have, uh, we're working very hard to encourage all Rotarians to come back to Rotary and I know that having their comfort and safety is important to all of us, so really appreciate your cooperation in that effort. I would hate for our sergeant at arms to have to pull out his enforcement hook, so uh, thank you for joining us in that important effort. Finally, a reminder about our fantastic lineup of programs over the next few weeks. Next week, as you know, is our Rotarian Daughter Holiday Lunch featuring Walgreens CEO Roz Brewer. Always such a favorite program. I know we're all excited about having our daughters here. And then we're off for the holidays until January 10th when we resume for our Economic Expert Series. Dennis Lockhart will be hosting an all-star lineup throughout the month of January. That includes Rafael Bostic, CEO of the Atlanta Federal Reserve, David Altig, Senior Economist with the Atlanta Fed, and William Hoagland with the Bipartisan Policy Center in Washington, D.C. We expect to have heavy turnout for each of those events, so please be sure to register early to hold your spot. Miguel Southwell will now introduce new member Anna Roach. Good afternoon, fellow Rotarians. It is a distinct privilege to introduce to the Atlanta Rotary Club 
its newest member, Mrs. Anna Roach, Chief Operating Officer for Fulton County. I also wish to thank and recognize our co-sponsors, Mr. Milton Little and Mr. Paul Morris, and unofficially, Egbert Perry, who also came up with the idea. Anna relocated to Atlanta 14 years ago and has quickly built a reputation as a people person, one who is able to build consensus among civic and business leaders to timely get things done, with the operative word being timely getting things done. In fact, that is how I met her three years ago. I received a call from a gentleman who represented that he was the new CFO's assistant and that Anna had come across my name as wanting to conduct some business at Fulton County Airport and that she wanted to know how she might help. My partner, Egbert, and I had waited three years for that call, and she had just become the new CFO. As the Chief Operating Officer, Fulton County, the largest county in the state of Georgia, serving over one million residents, Anna oversees more than 4,000 employees in 27 departments with a combined annual budget of nearly $1.2 billion. Among Anna's most recent successes is the Fulton County, as a Fulton County CFO, she administers all operations relating to the county's 400 million COVID-19 roadmap. She is creating some $165 million in what is called the Renew the District Development Plan to transform Fulton County's major industrial corridor, including where Fulton County's General Aviation Airport is located. It is therefore little wonder that only last week, as Madam President said, Anna was named Executive Director of the Atlanta Regional Commission, where she will succeed another distinguished member of the Atlanta Rotary Club, Mr. Doug Hooker, when he retires next year. Prior to serving in her current role as Chief Operating Officer for Fulton County, Mrs. Rhodes served as Fulton County's Chief Strategy Officer, where she developed and managed the county's first ever comprehensive multi-year strategic plan and performance management system. In recognition of those efforts, Anna received a National Association of Counties Award and was featured in the Association of County Commissioners of Georgia Magazine. Prior to joining Fulton County, Anna also served in the Atlanta area as a consultant, working for clients such as MADA, the State, of the State Department of Aging, and the City of East Point. Among the positions she held prior to coming to Atlanta, Anna served the Mayor of DC as Head of Legal and Policy Unit in the Office of the General Counsel. She was also a managing attorney of the Appeals Division for the Law Offices of Bruce A. Barkett in New York and an Administrative Law Judge for the City of New York. And finally, an Appellate Counsel for the Criminal Appeals Bureau for the Legal Aid Society. Anna earned a Juris Doctor from St. John's University School of Law and a Bachelor of Arts degree in Political Science from the State University of New York. She holds multiple leadership roles and maintains affiliation with several professional organizations, including serving on the advisory board of the Metro Atlanta Chamber of Commerce, American Bar Association, Leadership America, and Harvard University's Public Sector for Future Summit. She also has served with the March of Dimes, Tyler Technologies, and the Association of County Commissioners of Georgia, and finally the National Association of Counties. Anna migrated to the US from Jamaica when she was 13 years old. She lives in South Fulton with her husband, Mark, and their four children. I asked Anna what attracted her to Atlanta, and she told me that she had a friend of hers who graduated from the School of Theology and was engaged by a congregation here in Atlanta. And she wanted to come down to hear him uh, preach his first sermon. Um, so I deduced from that that it really was a calling for her to be here in Atlanta. <laughs> Fellow Rotarians, help me welcome Anna Roach as our new member.
welcome to the world's greatest Rotary Club. We are so excited to have you as a new member. Um, and I, I want to congratulate you again on your recent announcement. Thank you so much for all that you're already doing for this community and welcome. Thank you so much. Please be sure to stop by down front after the program today to meet Anna and welcome her to the club. I would now like to welcome to the podium our past president, uh, Dave Moody, who chairs this year's nominating committee and will conduct our official Rotary annual meeting business. All right. How's everybody doing today? I just want to tell you something. It's, it's really an experience to um, be your president, then the chair of the board, and then the chair of the nominating committee. You learn so much about this club, but more importantly, we have incredible members who really give a lot of their time to keep this club running. And I had great people helping me do this, uh, this process. And by any chance, is Alec Fraser here? I just want to give him a special thanks because he uh, would call me and walk me through, make sure I had everything in order as we did this. And we had a very smooth um, process. It went very well. We had a lot of the past presidents there and they were very active. But more importantly, as someone said, we're the greatest club. We really are. I don't care where I go in the world, I wear a rotary baseball cap. And I get more people who stop me and go, wow, you're in rotary. Then they go, what club? I don't care where I am in the world, I go downtown Atlanta. They go, really? Our club is special, folks. We're going to keep doing great things. And that's why I am so proud to take us and through our new officers for 2020, excuse me, 2022-23, and then our president-elect for 23-24. And there's your slate there, and if you're here, could you stand up for us? John Yates, are you here? All right. All right. Is Webb here? Okay, he's going to be our uh, secretary, program chair, David Lewis. I guess they're getting all their misses out now, so when their time comes. <laughs> all right, Pat, go ahead and stand up, Pat. I saw you. Stand up. I know, but I want to introduce you. She's going to be membership chair. And Kathy Waller has already been elected, y'all, so she stand up anyway. And then we have vice president of club service, Gary Reedy. All right, very good. <laughs> vice president of international service, Marianne Peters. All right, very good. <laughs> VP of Community, Keith Parker. I guess goodwill and community all go together, right? All right. Sergeant at Arms, Tom Chubb. All right. Then we have our two board of directors, uh, Adrian Crozier. All right. And Chris Womack. All right. Very good. Now, I've read the names. Next, I'm going to call for the vote. All those in favor of our new Slater officer say aye. Aye. Any oppose? If you do oppose, you take the job. All right, here you go. All right, the club officers for 2022 and 23 and the president-elect for 2023 through 24 is officially adopted. Stephanie Blank, stand up. Here's our president-elect for 2022-23, and she was voted in last year. And congratulations to all of you, and yes, we are the world's greatest club. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dave. It's hard for me to believe that my term is almost halfway over, and I'm so grateful to work with our current group of officers who are just fantastic. I know that they all join me in welcoming and being excited about this new group coming in, and we very much look forward to ensuring a, a smooth transition when we turn over the gavels uh, in July of this next year. I am now pleased to introduce Sheffield Hale, fellow Rotarian, who is CEO of the Atlanta History Center. Sheffield is a great friend of this club. We know him well, and he's a true thought leader in the community. 
You may remember we saw Sheffield just recently when Norfolk Southern announced its historic gift of memorabilia to the Atlanta History Center. And we're so excited to welcome Sheffield back to the podium today to share with us his thoughts on this very timely topic. Welcome, Sheffield. You know, Dave, that, would have, that um, exercise would have made the Soviet Parliament proud <laughs> in terms of the way you exercise democracy. So I, that's awesome, all right? And, and how timely today that we're gonna talk about democracy. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna talk about democracy. So it might be helpful first to talk about what I'm not gonna talk about. I'm, don't worry, I'm not gonna give you a lecture on the history of democracy in America or American Democracy 101, or a dissertation between a republic and a pure democracy. You can go read Alexis de Tocqueville and a host of others on that. Let's just stipulate that the United States is a constitutional democracy that has elements of both a republic and democracy. I'm not here to tell you that this is the most fraught time in history for our beloved American experiment. It has always been sketchy, and your relationship to democracy always depended on where you stand. Just pick an era and we can talk later. I'm not here to preach to you on the necessity of being civically engaged. You're the converted. Finally, I'm not here to tell you to go see our exhibit, American Democracy, traveling from the Smithsonian, which will, is open until March 23, or to tell you how we've tarted it up with fabulous artifacts from our deep collections and with great nuggets of information, like that Georgia voted for the Know Nothing Party with 40% of the vote in 1856 or that it ratified the Bill of Rights in 1939, or that Georgia was the first state to reject the 19th Amendment, giving women the right to vote, but did ultimately ratify it in 1970. All right, so now that that's out of the way, let's get to the issue at hand and what I am gonna talk about. Folks, we have a problem, and that is that our constitutional democracy is, shall we say, underperforming. Um, I hardly need to tell you that, but today I want to dig into some of the ways that the Atlanta History Center will seek to have influence where we can to make some positive change, and by the end I hope to persuade you that you and your organizations can do the same. Tomorrow our Board of Trustees will adopt a new strategic plan created to carry us through the 100th anniversary of the Atlanta History Center and the 250th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence, both of which happened to fall in 2026. For five years, we're committed to bringing exhibits, creating programs, engaging with community organizations, sponsoring forums, releasing clever videos, and more that link people and organizations with all sorts and conditions of Atlantans. Our goal is to help rehumanize each other and kindle some faith in democracy and our responsibility to improve it. All of this we offer as best we can in a spirit of humility and openness to new perspectives. So why democracy? Well, let's start at the beginning. I became CEO of the Atlanta History Center in March 2012, which feels almost like a decade ago. Our journey since then has led us first to methodology as to how to discuss and present difficult history, and ultimately how this approach will help us with issues related to democracy. Switching over from the board side to the staff side of the museum meant that I had a steep learning curve in terms of the museum field culture. The large museums, thought leaders, and associations that make a part of this world were more like an offshoot of academia in terms of their left-leaning approach to issues and a desire to right what the field saw as past wrongs. Much of it came from a concern that was much to correct in the museum world in terms of diversity of staff, attendance, artifacts, and the relaying of history as approached in the 19th and 20th centuries. All of that made and makes sense. Many stories have not been told or have been mistold and we all want and need a more diverse staff. Some parts of this culture though, particularly the language, can create barriers to doing the very thing our field is charged with, explaining the past. In 2017, I, had a, I attended a week-long workshop for museum leaders at Yale University. David Blight, a Pulitzer Prize winning scholar of the highest order and the director of the Gelder Lehman uh, Center for the Study of Slavery, resistance and abolition, including me with a small group of 20 people dealing with difficult history across the country. I felt like Margaret Mead from Mars the whole week, especially when I saw museum professionals infuriated with workshop leaders for introducing unannounced controversial history for discussion, the entire point of the conference. 
I got to watch a whole group get triggered, and I didn't do it. It was awesome. <laughs> I, that was worth the whole deal. But all of this caused me to ask the following question to my fellow attendees. Do you want people coming to your museum with whom you disagree? The answer was crickets. That signaled to me that we have a serious problem. How could we as history museums reach people to discuss history that has been unrecognized or misrepresented in the past if we can't talk about difficult topics between people who most likely agree? How can we then expect to reach people with stark differences? I returned to Atlanta with this front of mind. At the time, we were tackling the interpretation of the Battle of Atlanta cyclorama, as well as putting together a temporary exhibition called Barbecue Nation. Both were fraught, but let's focus on barbecue. As I began to read text panel after text panel in Barbecue Nation before it opened, I exclaimed, how in the hell can anybody take the joy out of barbecue? <laughs> I didn't know it was possible, but somehow we were about to do it. Look, I should have been more engaged at all points in the process, and these methods they were following, were, they were just following what was going on in the field, some of which I experienced in, at Yale. And don't get me wrong, food is often a means of talking about lots of other topics because it reflects much about our culture and society. But due to the strident language and extensive repetition of themes in terms like toxic masculinity, you could almost see barbecue as an instrument of oppression itself. Now, don't get me started on the jewel case showcasing barbecue Ken and Barbie dolls from the 1950s, which label carefully explained reflected gender norms that barbecue reinforced. Now, you know what was clever that made the same point on an opposite wall? A joyous photo of a female pitmaster in Harlem with a quote slathered in big letters from the sainted dean of American cookery, James Beard, that said simply, outdoor cooking is men's work. Now that's funny <laughs> and effective, and it says all it needs to say. We don't have to use language. Those are examples are just a few that demonstrate to me the important things that could be obscured by what James Carville calls faculty lounge talk, which to describe such talk in such talk is performative, full of white saviorism and heteronormative language. During this time, we had been addressing the issue of Confederate monuments across the country, and Stone Mountain in particular. For some reason, though this issue was no doubt controversial, it was a controversy that felt right and suited to our expertise. When addressing the Confederate monument issue, we, considered, we consistently came back to using historical context as a means of discussing larger issues. These monuments just don't bring up issues related to the Confederacy. They bring up everything the Confederacy stood for, including slavery, and later Jim Crow segregation, and the fundamental principle laid out by Confederate leaders that all men were not created equal. We dealt with similar issues through the Cyclorama Project, though in this I didn't go unscathed. One commenter on a Facebook thread connected to an Atlanta Magazine article on the Cyclorama restoration railed against Sheffield Hale and his bedwetting leftist friends. <laughs> I'm looking around the audience to see if any of you are here. <laughs> okay, I know this is all pretty insider baseball. So let me give you a hot current example in the news, critical race theory. What even is it? We could spend a whole session on it. Critical race theory, to oversimplify it to an extreme, essentially argues that criticisms such as the legal system are inherently racist and must be completely recreated. Now it is true that little, if any of this, is taught as such to fifth graders, and very few people opposing it have any idea what it is. But it is instructive as how the words, concept, and even history can be weaponized. For some people, they've arrived at the conclusion that history that reflects negatively on the country and that deals with race is, by definition, critical race theory. It seems to me that what folks are really upset about is this. It seems possible that his history is taught in schools, some schools, it points out that many white people in a historical past acted in a way that would be Republican polite society. Okay. Pretty hard to argue with. Five or ten years ago, the complaint was that school curriculum was attacking heritage when they posted that slavery was the root cause of the Civil War. In case you're confused about the difference between history and heritage, heritage is history with all the bad parts left out. <laughs> we must realize at the same time that the backlash of this concept of a difficult past gets traction partly due to the ineffective and incendiary use of jargon. It was the above examples and others that led to the development of our guiding principles, a commitment 
and description of the methods that we use as a history center to tackle difficult and controversial history, and now which will guide us in talking about the elements of democracy. In short, they say, words matter and show your work. We commit to staying in a place where we can talk to everyone who's willing to be civil and respectful, regardless of ideology. It's hard to do, and sometimes it doesn't seem possible, but these principles were written and adopted in, 19, in 2019, and they continue to grow in relevance. And if you don't think that words matter, just think what defund the police and even let's go, Brandon, have wrought. We also don't believe that the world is inherently zero sum. Zero sum means that resources are limited and can't be changed. So groups are always competing for them. In other words, if you're not winning, you're losing. Or in the words of the immortal Ricky Bobby, if you're not first, you're last. Instead of a zero sum approach, we approach history and democracy with a and focus on and, not or. Now, how is this related to our constitutional democracy? Our goal and mission are to connect people, culture, and history in a way of trying to strengthen communities by stressing that our history is all of ours. Though it might have been exper experienced differently by our ancestors, we also believe that history informs our common present and future. Reflecting on the Atlanta History Center's role in the Confederate Monument debate, along with the challenges to communication the field faced as a whole, we realized that we were thinking about our strategic focus in the wrong way. The question shouldn't be, what is the next controversial or current issue that we're qualified to weigh in on? Rather, as a history organization, the question should be, how can history identify the cracks in our foundation as a democracy, republic, and society? How can a history museum be a part of the solution in a way that other organizations can't? From our new strategic plan, we will focus on the role that the Atlanta History Center can play in a functional democratic system and hold democracy at the center of our research, scholarship, and storytelling. As people across our city, state, and country consider what it means to create a democracy functioning by and for everyone, Atlanta History Center will use its resources to explore the history of the components that make a healthy democratic system, including methods of civic engagement, widespread and informed voter participation, civil rights, and community heritage. Now, before we go much further, I want to pause for a moment and walk the talk, if you will, and ask you at your tables to take 10 minutes to discuss how these ideas might affect your own company's organization's lives, or you can check your email. I don't care. This result, this work is complex, and obviously one organization or even 100 can't be successful without partners and help. Here are the questions I want your tables to think about and discuss. How is the current condition of democracy impacting your business, organization, or clients, customers? What are the unique characteristics of you, your organization, that could address these matters? What can you do to create a better environment for democracy? Okay, you've got 10 minutes to fix it. Um, and there will be no report out, so no pressure on that. And if you want to talk about it later, come see me, and I'll, I'll wrap up after 10 minutes is up. Thank you very much. I always want to do that. All right, folks, we've got it all figured out. Now I'm going to give you the answer, OK? <laughs> Guess what? Democracy is really complicated. Uh, the issues we see today don't have a one-size-fits-all solution, and they don't have a solution rooted purely in one ideology. As a history organization, we're thinking about the unique qualities that we can bring to this debate. For us, those are a trusted platform, a non-political, non-partisan, non-governmental entity, primary sources and documentation that we're continuously working to expand and that can be analyzed to trace the origins of some of our current issues, especially when it comes to Georgia and Atlanta, a physical space that has assets and space to host events and exhibits, and a commitment to talk in plain English, particularly avoiding jargon that is more useful for signaling which side you're on than explaining. From our guiding principles, Atlanta History Center believes in clear, thoughtful communication that will stimulate curiosity while being straightforward on the facts. We will not be neutral regarding well-documented historical conclusions that might be considered controversial in the public sphere. Th through our presentation of difficult history, we do not seek to shame, label, or discourage visitors. Rather, we seek to engage them through exhibitions, programming, and outreach that encourage discussions that are empathetic, historically informed, inclusive, and inclusive of all members of the community. Our goal is not to flip audiences, but to try to bring as many people along as possible, while at the same time reaching out to new audiences. Importantly, we don't try to change minds. We don't believe that our greatest obligation is to establish that we're right, but to be effective in providing information in a context that can perhaps offer the opportunity to see new perspectives. 
Using the characteristics I outlined in our platform, we are undertaking several new projects and initiatives guided by our strategic plan. These include ex exhibitions that focus on crucial issues related to democracy, a variety of programming which includes dialogue events, guest speakers, and casual gatherings at cool places around the city, among other events. These are all designed to encourage community and connection focused around our shared and often messy history. Educational programs that bring good history to students in our own creative way, free of political influence. A digital presence including short films and documentaries that share history in new and engaging ways. Collaborations with local and national partners, of which there are increasing numbers, and many of which are in this room, who have expertise and are already engaged in efforts focused on improving democracy. Look, like a speaker said to this club several months ago about how to engage unvaccinated people, we don't have a vaccine in our back pocket. Our goal isn't to follow our visitors out of the museum and make sure they learn something. But we hope that through these and other projects, we can give the opportunity for surprise, perspective, and dare I say it, joy. In closing, while several of the examples I have given are focused on the illiberal left, examples abound on the radical right whether it's Charlottesville or January 6. Our constitutional democracy is at times threatened by a far left that wants to take the whole structure they define as racist, classist, or fill in the blank and replace it with an illiberal one, and a radical right trying to release the animal spirits of nativism and class and racial insecurity. These forces have been around for most of the country's existence in one form or another. What makes it particularly concerning now is that more and more people, whether they realize it or not, are being attracted to anti-democratic authoritarian rhetoric from what used to be the fringe left and the fringe right. Where does this come from? I truly believe we must start tackling some of the causes and not just the symptoms. And if you look at the symptoms, whether it be anti-vaccine campaigns, not turning up at the polls like we didn't do recently, or the Buckhead City movement, one cause is a civic failure to recognize the mutual obligations we owe each other as humans if we are to sustain a durable, self-perpetuating constitutional democracy. What the Atlanta History Center plans to do is to use our guiding principles to tell our history, which can explain our system of government, and one that has proven so far to be the most effective at building a truly multicultural democracy and fostering innovation and freedom, albeit imperfectly. That democracy can only be improved and our union only made more perfect if sufficient numbers of us, of us are engaged and believe it is fair. On the eve of the 250th anniversary of the United States, the longest lived constitutional democracy in the known universe, we can also offer the perspective that it's been worse. Our democracy is resilient if we pay attention. There are, there are alternatives to hand wringing or retreating into echo chambers and bespoke cities. The folks in this room are already involved in all levels of civic engagement. This project must be more than statements. Instead, it must be about talking to people that have alternative perspectives without the goal of winning. You don't have to win every argument in every setting or conversation. Our view is that it, the other issues in society cannot be resolved unless we have a functioning democracy that has participation, trust, and the belief in the necessity of compromise. Otherwise, solutions will be temporary because they will have, for different reasons, less legitimacy in the eyes of most of the citizens. I don't, see, I don't see the need to point at the signs about this all around us. I am optimis optimistic. I'm a big fan of the, of the power of enlightened self-interest in a non-zero-sum future. So let's at least strive toward that. To me, this is pretty close to the aspirations of the Rotary four-way test, the best of the Atlanta way, or even the motto of the state of Georgia, wisdom, justice, moderation. Thank you very much. I'm happy to take questions. Anybody I did not offend? <laughs> but one, I'll represent my table, I guess. Um, so John and Chloe uh, came up with uh, a very great idea, or all of us did, for trying to further democracy uh, as, as a group. Um, and they recommended uh, possibly a similar events such as Rotary on the Road but to the, uh, to the history center uh, and allowing people to have a lunch there and, and then get into, obviously, deeper conversations. 
So I think that's quite, an, uh, quite a tangible uh, and useful way to improve those uh, ideas that we talked about. Love that. I'm looking at Billy Levine. <laughs> uh, thank you, Chloe, for being our shill. I appreciate it. Um, she's my trustee, so anything she says is, good, is a good idea. <laughs> Great idea. Thank you. What are, uh, Jeff? Yeah, I saw you there. Yeah, I was like, who is she? It was a bad offer we wouldn't be married. But, um, <laughs> can you use that speaker series further? Um, I'd still like you to have a variety of speakers and a variety of topics. But this would seem to be a natural theme to carry through a lot of the speaker series. Yeah, if we can get people to come to Atlanta in person, we definitely will do that. And that's, you know, it's hard right now because of the publishers and the, the variant and everything else. But we are going to end up having also our book lectures that we get when people on book tour. But the, for the first time, we're going to set aside money to be able to pay people to come to talk about what we want to talk about, not what they want to talk about. Um, and, and so that's part of our strategy over five years. We've, I got a Gantt chart working out. I don't even know what a Gantt chart is, but they tell me about it. All right, who else? Uh I think fundamental to this problem is the fact that for two generations, we have neglected the study of social studies in this country. Uh, for a number of reasons, it's been declining uh, in terms of funding available to it has been declining dramatically. So the average American today lacks a basic knowledge and understanding of the world and the people in it as a result of this. And as a secondary thing, which is even more important, and acting on what you're discussing, is the fact that they don't know anything about their own history. Too many, too many Americans today couldn't tell you who George Washington was. So until we looked at the fundamental changes there in the basics as far as social studies is concerned, I think we've, we've got an ongoing problem. Uh, in terms of um, the studies that have been done for the, in the national area for National Geographic, nation, uh, uh, geopolitics, that sort of thing over the last several years, They've indicated that the average high school and college a graduate in this country doesn't have this knowledge and understanding, but what the studies also reveal that it's not because they're disinterested. They are interested, they realize that there's a deficiency here, but they've just, been, they've just never been given an opportunity to learn about these things. Well, there, there are a lot of people working on that nationally. There's some great national organizations that are working on it. We're part of one called Made By Us that is going after the 15 to 30 year olds. Um, but, and we've created something called Civic Season for them, which is between four, Juneteenth and the 4th of July. How do you connect those two holidays? And, and we're working hard to get them engaged in that, in that level. Um, a lot of history museums do it, but you're right. Everything's been focused on, on uh, you know, the things that John Yates cares about. Um, but we need to um, focus on history. So Sheffield, you're a uh, student, maybe a professor of history, certainly most knowledgeable about what's happening the history of Atlanta. Um, during the civil rights movement and uh, the racial issues of the 60s, Atlanta leaders certainly took a, an interesting position and worked their way through those. I'm wondering, can you give us some thoughts about lessons that you're aware of during that period of time that we might be able to consider today as we're dealing with <coughs> different set of issues relating to democracy and equality, but still some very important issues? Well, I think enlightened self-interest I talked about was part of that. And being lucky is really important. You'd have Birmingham next door. It was awesome. Um, makes everybody look good. Um, you know, that whole, that whole era was not perfect, but people, you know, within the context of that time tried their best, and they were trying the best for the city, and I think that's what we need now. Um, what we want people to do is to get connected locally and give a damn about their community. And if they care about themselves, the, their community and their neighbors, they'll get engaged and then they'll care about democracy. So uh, for us, it, it's a lot of that, but, um, but you're right. Um, that, that, was a great, that was an interesting period. It's fraught in many ways, but we can learn a lot about it, but it helps to be lucky. Um, and it also helps to have people who are looking to do the right thing um, because it makes sense for them. Um, and, it, and it just helps. And, uh, and right now, if you look around us, there are a lot of opportunities for that. Um, and 
I'm, hope, I'm hopeful that our, this generation will step up to it. The new mayor and city council will, will pay attention and that we can um, have, a, have, a, have a good, you know, we don't want to turn into Charlotte, okay? That's where money goes to die, by the way. One more question right here. Last, our last question. I already know what to say, Chef Bell, without making a joke. So um, you and I have had several conversations on this. I guess the point I take from this uh, is that this cannot be just a history center project. Peter's point, if we haven't talked taught this in two decades, we're gonna have to work on it for two decades, to, two generations, we're gonna have to work on it that long to get it back. So I think the, the key to what you're presenting, because you've got a five year commitment to it, is that uh, our media companies, our rotary clubs, our social services, our congregations, all need to be a, a part of this, of creating safe places to talk with people that don't agree with each other of really looking at the mechanisms of how democracy works, because it's under attack. I mean, two years later when you say, you know, that election doesn't count, but we've done that, that's a, that's a path down as far as our democracy. So I know I'm involved with Atlanta Civic Circle. That's our North Star, democracy. That's what we want to work on. And I think there's a lot of institutions in town that could take up this call so that it's a collaborative between us and let the history center be the, you know, the container of, of both history and uh, processes that we could use to dialogue with each other. So I appreciate the commitment, Chef Bill, of you and the history center. Yeah, we're, we're, we're hoping, hoping to do that. And, and, and again, it's, it's a, it's a, it is a collective effort. It's about getting people at the lower, lowest level in terms of the baseline. Let's go to the causes. The symptoms, I'm not gonna to touch the symptoms right now. They're toxic, right? We need to focus on the causes and education is one of them. Talking to each other is another. You know, knowing a little bit about civics. All those are causes of our current dysfunction. And how can we get to others that will help us have a better democracy? All right, thank you, Chef Bill. Congratulations again to all of our officers and Sheffield, thank you for engaging us in this incredible conversation. It's so timely. Uh, we truly appreciate your thought leadership and especially your wonderful sense of humor. So uh, come back and, and keep us posted again in the future. Um, hope you all have a wonderful week. Please be sure to join us next week for our Rotarian Daughter Holiday Luncheon and we will see you then. Thank you.